Hello, everybody. It's Paul Kegabine at the Garland County Library, and I am here with the Garland County Master Gardener, Know It to Grow It chairperson, Miss Judy Dare. And Judy, we were uh, talking about how many episodes it's been, and I just did a quick count during the countdown. And if my number is right, it's at least episode 17. Oh, wow. That's pretty cool. Uh, yeah, that's more than I expected, but makes sense. We do them every month. I know every month and we've been doing it for a while. I have had a little technical glitch. Give me just a second. I'll be right back. Take your time. Um, I will try to stall, but I <laughs> no Judy. She, she knows everything she wants to say. <laughs> um, but this is actually going to be episode three of a mini series, part of the overall Know It to Grow It series about homesteading in a modern world. So we have a returning present yeah we have a no favorite yes um but so before i turn it over to judy she's going to have a special surprise guest uh before we yes. get to that i do want to uh point out we have another gift card prize tonight we're giving away a 25 dollars gift card to hot springs sod and turf and one of you live viewers name will be on it at the end of this program all you have to do is ask a question. Yep. And then Paul puts your name kind of in a virtual hat and stirs them all up and pulls one out. And in the program, you, you've got your prize. And it's a great prize. I love that place. It's a, one of my favorite places to shop. And I don't know. Is it is it time for me to do my thing, Paul? Do I'm turning it over to you. Well, if, unless you have anything else. If you, if you want to stall, we can. No, I, I've got, I've, I figured it out. All right. All right. Here we go. Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to another great installment of Know It to Grow It. I know you all know it. It's been hot and dry in gardening land, and I hope your gardens are surviving in this brutal weather. It is not easy. Uh, tonight's speaker is, as Paul said, a Know It to Grow It favorite, Jamie Wilkerson, with her third installment of Homesteading in a Modern World. And she's going to be talking about the various methods she uses to prefer, preserve her harvest. Um, which has been a tough thing to get this year. But before we get to Jamie, I have a Know It to Grow It follow-up and a special guest. Now, last month we had park ranger Casey Johansson talking to us about light pollution and how it affects our environment and the things that live and grow in it. I would like to introduce Phil Griggs, a member of the Light Uptown Committee to tell us about a project that has incorporated some of the light pollution diminishing techniques Casey talked about last month. So um, is Phil on? Hi there. Phil. Now, um, can you tell us a little bit about the project, about how long it's been going on and what its purpose is? Certainly. Uh, the project is called Light Up Town, which is uh, Park Avenue from Whittington uh, up to Circle Drive is what the project entails. And what we're trying to do is we're installing Central Park style lighting uh, along Park Avenue because there are some very, very <clears throat> dark places along Park Avenue that we wanted to solve. We also wanted to make it aesthetically beautiful. So this project sprang out of, in 2001, the city had a uh, master plan that included Park Avenue and there was a lighting project included in that. But then 9-11 happened. So everything kind of went on hold. And so they revisited the master plan, I think in 2007. And because economics weren't so good at that time, everything went on hold. Well, Hannah Mills, our fearless leader of Light Up Town, uh, went to the city and said, you remember that master plan? where's the map for that? You surely got it on the computer. And so they pulled up the map and they said, aha. So Hannah uh, devised a way that we could start raising money to buy these lights. And we started with a, a, a outreach program called Summerfest. And it was a, a small uh, neighborhood uh, art festival and had music and all of that to raise money. And out of that, uh, we got to buy our first light in 2013 and we had one light, 
because at that time the lights cost about $3,500 a piece. And we had raised that much money. We bought one light. And from that one light, uh, interest in the project sprang up with uh, a lot of the uh, local philanthropists in town. And they started donating money uh, to the project. And uh, it took us about, uh, I don't know, two years to raise enough money to buy four more lamps. So we bought four more lamps. And then two years ago, before COVID hit, we had a very large fundraiser uh, at the uh, Malco Theater, and we raised enough money to buy 12 lamps. So now we have 18 lamps along Park Avenue. And the thing that I think that interests you the most is the light pollution with Correct. the lamps. Because we wanted, we wanted it, like I said, to be aesthetically beautiful, but we also wanted to be... Uh, compliant with a night sky project. So we didn't want light going up. We wanted light just going down to light the bike lanes, the sidewalks and all of that. So we had to really research and it took us about a year to research what kind of lamps we wanted to get. And with the help of uh, MOR slash CED electric, uh, they helped us research that and we pick the lamps that we have and the, the ones that we're putting up now. And that leads to the fundraiser that we're having this Sunday at the Vapors Live, which is going to be a variety show and fundraiser uh, to help us raise more money so we can put more lamps on the road. So, now, how many more lamps do you need? Well, the, the, the entire project uh, was 77 lamps. That's lighting both sides of Park Avenue. And what the committee decided is we will do that one side of the street at a time. So we're going to light the west side of Park Avenue first. And then once we get all of those installed, then we'll start on the east side of Park Avenue. Because oh. the west side of Park Avenue is much darker than the east side. Well, I think it's an awesome program. Now, tell them how, um, oh, and the library has such an intrinsic relationship with the vapors they've had the author of the vapors book and all those things so it the, all these things come around and i think it's really under understated that the community really does work together and and things things go forward in a slow manner but in the best manner right. and so um tell us a little bit more about how you can get tickets to the event what time it is and things like that sure uh the doors open at 5.30 at the Vapors Live, and the show starts at 6.30. We'll have uh, Sylvia Stems will be performing. Uh, Miranda Jean will be performing. Uh, we'll have uh, a Charlie Chaplin will be there. And we also have Shirley Chauvin and her accompanist will be the headliner. And... Uh -huh. Uh, like I said, the show starts at uh, 6.30. There will be a silent auction as well as, and we have some fabulous silent auction items. And then there will also be live auction. Matt Godby here is our MC and auctioneer. You know, he's a local auctioneer here in town. And he will be our MC and auction off some of the more expensive items. We have some fine art. We have some jewelry from Lorraine's and we have a lot of good things. So, we, you know, there'd be something there for everyone from a very expensive to very inexpensive for the, in the, in the silent auction. That's awesome. Well, I applaud you all for doing what you're doing. I hope everybody can come out to the fundraiser. And if not, I'm sure that you will accept donations outside Absolutely. of the fundraiser. You, that's right. You can go to www.pacahotsprings.org and on that page there will be a place that you can make donations. You can make a donation directly to PACA. You can make a donation to Light Up Town. You can make a donation to the splash pad that we're planning for Watkins Park and we'll have a fundraiser for that later on in the year. So, Splash pad sounds really good right about now. Right. <laughs> And I, I'd also like to mention 
that uh, PACA through uh, CDBG grants, you know, that's what got us all of our bump outs and our rain gardens and uh, the bike lanes and all of that. So, you know, we wanted to, to get the rain gardens to, to help with the flooding downtown yes. and there's all and with we have natural what's native native plants planted in all of the uh rain gardens so you're just talking my language <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, want, you know uh this into town is is very uh ecologically uh conscious i guess you would say so that we're trying oh. to do everything right well, I appreciate it. I hope the fundraiser is a huge success, and I really appreciate you joining us tonight. And uh, I guess I'm, I ought to mention the price, huh? Oh, the price, yeah. the price is $50 a ticket. We have $75 VIP tickets, but we only have just a very few VIP tables left. So uh, we'd so love to see you. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. We're going to get on to the program, but y'all have a good night and thank you very much for doing what you're doing uptown. Thank you, Judy. Talk to you soon. All right. So I just think it's wonderful that we're having such environmentally friendly projects going on in hot springs and the, you know, the term native plants just drive me crazy. Anyway, Please remember to submit your questions in the chat box for a chance to win that great gift certificate to Hot Springs Sod and Turf. And the winner can pick up their prize at the Garland County Library Circulation Desk. Now on to tonight's program. Jamie, her husband Wes, and their six children moved to Hot Springs in 2016 to find their forever home. They found the perfect spot and started Honey Hole Homestead in 2020. They really wanted to get back to the basics of life and wanted their children to know what it was like to garden, preserve their own food, and live a simpler life. They began their homesteading experience then. They live in a tiny house and are in the process of building their forever house. Jamie became a master gardener in 2021 and was the first graduate of the Garland County Library, I'm sorry, Garland County Master Gardener online class. She was also named 2021 Garland County Master Gardener Rookie of the Year, which is no small feat. In addition to gardening, she enjoys cooking, preserving her harvest, and spending time with her family. And as always, I'm happy to welcome Jamie Wilkerson. Hey, everybody. Thanks for having me today. Hey, Jamie. I'm going to turn it over to you. you. What is it? I'm just going to turn it over to you. Okay. <laughs> so in our first episode of Homesteading in a Modern World, we went over the basics of how to get started with your homestead, whether you had the time or the size of the land to put forward to it. Our second episode, we went through how to start our garden, how to do container gardens if you didn't have a large area, how to do large areas, and what to put your time into. With So all of that's been discussed in our other two episodes. Um, if you're new here tonight, you can go back and find those on the Garland County's uh, YouTube and get caught up on that. I am wanting to show with y'all tonight on how to preserve that garden bounty. That way you and your family can enjoy it all year long. I have a lot to discuss and so I made cheat sheets to try to make sure I have all the pointers um, because some, it's easy to put up everything but there it is also you want to follow certain steps that way you're preserving your food safely for your family because there's a lot of toxins that um, can go into uh, canning and dehydrating and other ways of preserving food. So before I get started, I just want to say thank y'all and let's get started on the one of the two, let's see, let's go with freezing. That's one of our simpler ones. We all have freezers on top of our refrigerators. We have chest freezers, we have stand up freezers and some of us might be new to canning and might not have a pressure canner, water bath canner, or any of the other methods of preserving. So with freezing, it's super easy. Even for those people that have smaller gardens, you might not have a big haul of produce from your garden. You might only have a couple hands full here and there, but you can take that produce and by blanching it, cleaning it real good, getting the dirt off, you know, stems and all that first, but then have your pot of boiling water 
and you are going to submerge your vegetables in this boiling water. And this method is called blanching. Blanching is going to heat up the surface Sorry about that. We shut up for a minute. <laughs> Blanching is uh, going to heat up the surface of your vegetables, killing any microorganisms that you might not have got off by just washing your produce. And this will aid in when you go to put it in the freezer for when you're ready to use it later on. Um, so you want to, uh, if you got a big thing of tomatoes, a lot of people that have gardens have big crops of tomatoes. Well, you're so busy trying to gather your produce, you don't have time to can it. So this is where blanching and freezing comes in. You take it, core out your seeds of your tomatoes and your the core in the center. Blanch it, put it in a freezer and freeze it for this winter. When things slow down, you have more time, you can do tomato sauce, you can do salsa, you can do anything you want this winter because once you take those tomatoes out of the refrigerator, that skin's gonna slide right off. So once you get that going, you can also do corn, which is one of our big things we've done. We can our corn, but we like fresh corn on the cob. So I like to blanch the corn on the cob and I like to put it in freezer safe bags. Now, a lot of people use Ziploc bags. Make sure they say freezer safe because the ones that are just like storage, they're not really I guess I don't think enough, I think the seams aren't, they'll bust. Um, I like to use my food saver and what the food saver is, it's a, like a little machine. I don't know if y'all can see it that well, but it takes these little bags that are freezer safe. You fill this with your blanched food and you, well, we're gonna blanch our food. Then we'll go to an ice bath to drain it, then put it in here. And then you'll put it in here. You'll seal it. It sucks all the air out and the moisture. So therefore your food is in these. I love these because it keeps the freshness of your produce better than a Ziploc. Um, I know Ball Henning has some freezer uh, plastic rigid storage containers and they work well. Um, so just really whatever you have room for. Um, start like vegetable, like corn and peas, everything peel, cut it off the cob or shell it, wash it, blanch it in the hot water. And however long the recipe in the, whatever you're going by says, blanch it for anywhere from one to 10 minutes, depending on the, you know, the toughness of the vegetable, really, you're going to have an ice bath. And when I say ice bath, all it is, is I take a container a dish pan like this. I fill it with cold water and I also put ice in it. That way it stops the cooking for when you're blanching it because that water's boiling your vegetables. And then you transfer it over there and it stops the cooking process. So stir it around, you know, make sure it's nice and cool. Say you blanch your tomatoes for two minutes, leave them in your ice bath for two minutes and then preserve them away in the freezer. I do have a um, little cheat sheet in case anybody wants to know, you know, okra, you'll blanch it for three minutes. Um, what you want on okra though, I was going to show you, I have these. I went to the uh, Hot Springs Farmer's Market and Ray Five Farms. I got me some okra because the heat killed mine. But you have, I don't know if you can see it. It's kind of hard to see. This really large okra and this small okra. On okra, you're going to cut your stem end off. And some people like to cut off the little bloom ends. But uh, the smaller ones, you can free, blanch them and freeze them whole. The larger ones, cut the stem off and cut it up into chunks and freeze it that way. Then you can defrost it, put cornmeal on it and fry it or cook it however you'd like. Uh, let's see, we have potatoes. I've never froze potatoes. I'm more of a can in them, but um, I guess you could do that. You just peel them, wash them, wash them first, peel them, then wash them again because all the grime and the starch comes off. Blanch them and then store them in your in ice bath and then store them in the freezer. What, one thing that you do not blanch is your peppers, your onions, and your herbs. Anything that you're using for a seasoning, it takes the taste away. So it's not quite as strong when you blanch them. So just chop those up, wash them, chop them up, freeze them like that. I know green onions, um, I've seen this really cool idea where 
you take your green onions, cut them up, put them in a water bottle and screw it back on and chunk it in the freezer. That way when you need them, you can just shake them out. So that's a tip if you want to do that. Uh, squash. Now with squash, there is two different kinds of squash. You have your summer squash, which we all know, the yellow squash, crooked neck squash, zucchini. You're going to take it, wash it, cube it up, blanch it, and do it the process the same way. Now, winter squash has a thicker skin, and when it comes to freezing it, you have to cut it in half because it's kind of like just like a pumpkin. It has the seeds and the pulp and everything in it. So you'll want to scrape out that seeds that way because you don't want to cook that or anything. Discard it, turn it over, cut side down on a greased baking dish, and at 375, you want to bake in the oven and for just until the inside, the pulp is nice and mushy. And then once it's mushy, you scoop it out and store it in your container of choice. So that's the difference in those two squashes, but just about anything. Uh, berries, if you want to freeze berries, because um, I know a lot of people have berry patches and right now blueberries have been a big thing and uh, blackberries are coming in and stuff. Take your berries, wash them, Get the stems, any mushy berries, any overripe berries, get discard those. But the only key with berries, you need to preserve them with sugar or a heavy syrup to freeze them so that they keep that taste. If not, they just kind of, they lose their flavor and their texture. With um, berries, you do one part sugar to four parts berries. So like if you're just doing the sugar method, one cup of sugar, four cups berries, shake it around put it in a Ziploc bag or freezer in container and do it that way. Now, if you're doing a heavy syrup, because like strawberries and syrup, I suggest you get um, a ball preserving cannon book. Let's see. I have several books. This is a guide to preserving by ball. I think Amazon has it. Uh, the ball website has it. It has recipes for your different fruit syrups like light syrup and heavy syrups, depending on the different kind of sugars and stuff. So always go by that. And this book here, as we talk about stuff, as we're uh, talking about different ways to preserve stuff, this book, along with these others, um, at the end of the video, I'll show you the different ones I have. Um, and that way, in case you're new and you want to go by the book, um, they are really good about different strategies on making sure you do your canning safely, um, do your uh other ways of preserving your food all safely that way you're not coming into risk with any of the toxins and uh the bad bacteria. the the botulism is like one of the biggest things that's out there and if you don't can something right everybody screams that word so get you one of these books the canning bible so we've discussed freezing another easy method which is not it's easy but it might not be all easily on hand for some people is dehydrating with dehydrating you're taking your vegetables and placing them in a dehydrator i have two of them i, mean, I don't know if you can see it as well but i have an excalibur an older model that gets to a lower temperature um that way i can do my herbs like oregano thyme and rosemary stuff with those really brittle leaves i can take and put them in here and turn it, I think it's down to 80 or 85, and let them cook in there. And if I say cook, they're drying out in there. That way I can make different spices, or I can just have that, I grind it up, and I have my own spice bottle of thyme, oregano, or I even can use peppers in this larger one. This is a larger tin one. It's got tin shelves. They're just plastic with holes in it and you can buy some i think they're silicone mats um they have mesh nonstick mesh mats or you can use parchment paper and place your items so that if you have anything that'll fall through these holes um like with making your spices with your dehydrator you can use your onions and your garlic and your peppers and you'll dehydrate them you'll want to cut everything that's going in the dehydrator thin so it don't take as long to dehydrate. And I have found that this slicer, or yeah, I mean, it don't have to be this one, but just a mandolin slicer that cuts them up. This one has different depths in your cutting. That way, you know, 
how thin or how thick you're cutting something. Just slide it on there. Layer it in one layer. Don't stack them on top of anything because you want the airflow to go through. Um, and you can dehydrate them. Uh, they store on your shelf. You can put them in jars, just regular uh, mason jars. You put the lid on, seal it. Um, oxygen absorbers, um, you know, the little things that think bacon bits has always has the oxygen absorbers in them. Um, you can buy them on Amazon, packs of a hundred, a thousand, as many as you need. When you get through dehydrating, let your items cool off. That way it's not warm going in here because we all know we put something warm and something seal it up. It kind of fogs up the outside with moisture. So let your food in your dehydrator come to a cool before putting it in your jars. Another thing on dehydrating, let's see, is my food saver has, let's see, put our top on. I'm not going to, it's this little contraption that hooks to it. You push it over your drawer like that. We'll stick your hose in and then I would hook this other end to my food sealer and it has all the buttons that say seal and vacuum and everything. I'd use the vacuum only and it creates a seal in my vacuum. That way they're sealed shut. When this you hit release on there, take this off, pull this off, this is sealed shut. So that's another way to store your flour, your rice, your cornmeal. You can use these big half gallon jars and store that so that way it lasts a little bit longer than instead of the bags that way you can buy in bulk and have it on hand flour sugar you don't have to worry about any kind of buggies or anything getting in it moisture getting in it if it's with that food saver let's see when you're doing your dehydrating fruits always dip them in uh, a protector kind of like lemon juice or lime juice that is going to seal in the different acids that the, well, they're the acids sealing it in I mean, don't turn brown on you um i think ball has a clear fruit protectant and it's in a jar like a shaker i don't have none. i use lemon and lime juice um but do that that way your fruit's not all brown and everything let's see you can make fruit leather and that's basically taking your fruit puree and pureeing it up in a blender and removing the seeds or not it can be just juice and putting it on parchment paper or one of the non-stick uh pads spread it in there it don't have to have no sugar in it so that makes it a little bit healthier than those fruit roll-ups you buy roll it out in there and when it's done it's a tacky kind it's kind of sticky but if it's on that parchment paper you can cut it in the strips and roll it up just like the fruit leathers so that's an option to do for the kids also my kids like marshmallows in the there we buy a bag of just regular marshmallows or the flavored marshmallows put them in there dehydrate them it's like the lucky charms marshmallows when it gets done uh veggie chips fruit chips that way it's healthy alternatives and stuff for your kids so i think that just about covers our dehydration part um like i said it's simple some people even use their oven i have not tried the oven some of mine think my oven goes down low enough because you have to really be at a lower temperature for longer periods to dehydrate because you don't want to burn the items. So, but there is people that have used their oven for that and their sun dehydrating. Um, if the electricity went out, you do have ways where you can put on screens outside and just let it naturally dry. A lot of people do that with, they make sun ovens and put screens in there and put their herbs in there. So that's one way of doing that. Um, another way of preserving your food, which I won't talk a lot about these two things because I don't really do it and a lot of people don't do them, but it's fermenting. Um, fermenting is where you take a salt brine and you're going to take, let's like cabbage and carrots and onions and beets and just different kind of root vegetables. A lot of people do. Um, you're going to put it in a jar with this salt brine that you make. Kimchi is another one, but, uh, you can order from the ball uh, site. This is a fermenting kit. It's got springs in it with lids with little holes. But when you put your vegetables in your sterile jars and you put them in there and fill it up with liquid, you want to make sure there's a weight or a spring or something holding your vegetables at least one inch underneath the brine. But that way, there, anything sticking up is not getting air and any kind of bad bacteria. The brine and the warmth, you want to keep it between 65 and 75 degrees 
That way it ferments. If it's cooler, it's going to take longer. But if it's hotter than 75, you're setting up a breeding ground for the mold and the, back, the bad bacteria. So you want the salt and everything for the good bacteria, the probiotics. So keep the vegetables in there for the desired amount of time that whatever recipe you're going by. And you have to take it the top off. If you don't have one of the ones with the holes to let some of the gases out every day, take it, release it, maybe stir it, put it back in, put it back in a cool, dark place for as long as time as it takes. So that's sauerkraut, kimchi. You do your Worcestershire sauce, your hot sauce, uh, mustards done that way. Um, you soak your mustard seeds and then you uh, grind them up. And you can all, there's also, it's called tempeche, tempeche. It's a fermented pineapple drink it's um more served um it's a mexican drink and so but it's fermented pineapple so and kombucha is like really popular um with fermenting um you have to have a scooby which is um it looks like a big old mushroom floating in there but your scooby is what grows the good bacteria your probiotics and stuff so there's a lot of recipes for kombucha that you can find um, another way of preserving your food, um, this is more, it's not really about your vegetables. It's on your homestead. If you have pigs or cows or something, you can cure and smoke your meats. Um, curing is by using salt in your, and you're just going to put it on there and it's going to pull out the moisture and you're going to put it underneath the slow smoke which has a heat to it so it's really going to seal that salt it's going to crack it and harden it and keep all this good stuff that you're made in there it's a long process but you know hams and bacon prosciutto stuff like that is all a way of curing so i just want to throw that in there for people that might want to try that um eggs are another thing on the homestead that a lot of people want to know how to preserve uh you can freeze your eggs which don't freeze them separated because the whites get kind of rubbery and they're they're not really that great. Um, mix the mix of the egg, like scramble it, but don't really mix it where you have a lot of air bubbles. Just kind of go back and forth with your fork, make like a slurry, pour it um, into ice cube molds, and that way you have individual eggs. Or you can freeze it in one large container. Uh, three tablespoons of frozen egg equals one egg. So you know that. Um, you can dehydrate scrambled eggs. You just would scramble them like regular, put them in there and dehydrate them. I haven't done that, but you can. Um, then you would just seal them up like with your food saver, make sure they're really sealed in a jar and reconstitute with uh, bowl and water. Uh, another preserving method that you can do is freeze drying them. You mix them up, pour them on your pan and freeze dry them crack them up and you have an egg powder to use in baking or reconstitute scrambled eggs or something like that. So you can also uh, water glass your eggs and water glassing. You take a uh, pickling lime and you place it with water in your sterile uh, half gallon mason jar. It holds about a dozen eggs. You want to use clean, fresh eggs. Don't wash them. Um, just make maybe paper towel, paper towel if they have any debris on them. But you want them to be clean eggs. And you would stack them in here in water with your pickling line. And it's called water glassing. And they are shelf stable for up to a year. So that way, if you need eggs during the winter when your chickens aren't laying, you have eggs. Um, so, like I said, don't use the eggs that are dirty with any kind of mud or uh hay or anything like that on you they need to be really clean eggs almost like they came from a store um your eggs also most people didn't realize you can leave your eggs on your countertop if you have them don't wash them because they have a bloom on them and when i say bloom it's a protective coating that i think i have one over here it's we keep ours on the shelf in baskets um this one's of course needs washed before i use it but um when you use it, you just wash them, use them. That coating keeps the bacteria from going in that porous eggshell. So that's a couple ways to do your eggs. Um, let's see. Uh, I mentioned freeze dryer. That is also another uh, preservation method. I currently do not have a freeze dryer. It is on my wish list. They're just pricey. But yes, they're, um, with freeze drying, it's similar to dehydration. But uh, dehydration takes out about 80% of your 
moisture content out of your vegetables. Whereas if you freeze dried your vegetables, it takes out 98%. Now that extra 18% make the way it vaporizes it under pressure makes them more shelf stable for a longer period of time. Now your dehydrated ones for about a year, they're good up on the shelf. Then you kind of want to start watching them and using them. With freeze dryer, as long as you put them in the Mylar bags or you use the food saver and seal them in your jars, they say that it's good up to 25 years, uh, especially in the Mylar bags. Um, that's what the MREs are in. You know, you can not only can you just freeze dry your fruits and vegetables, you can go ahead and make a vegetable soup. You can go ahead and make mashed potatoes. Make whatever you'd like. Put it in your freeze dryer, freeze dry it, put it in a Mylar bag, reconstitute it with boiling water, and you have that product so that's another way like i said i don't have one of those yet that's on my wish list <laughs> so but those are the easier ways of preserving your food which canning's pretty easy so i'm going to move into canning um now because i know that's a lot of people came here to watch um we're first going to talk about water bathing water bath canning is for your um foods like your pickles and they're low acid. I mean, yeah, they're high acid foods like pickles and apples and peaches. High acid can go into the water bath. Low acid has to go into your pressure canner. Um, when I say water bath, um, it don't have to be, it just needs to be able to hold your can, your jars. This is a water bath canner. You would take and fill it with water. It has a rack on the inside. It holds seven quarts and eight pints. So that is, put that in there and you would submerge about an inch over the water, over your jars to water bath. Now things that you water bath uh, are your, like I said, your tomatoes, your apples, pickles, um, salsas, some people like to do, just depends. The ball canning book has lots of water bath canning. There's ice, um, I think it's ooh, the all new ball book of canning and preserving has a lot of water bath recipes in it that you can use. Um, so just remember that low, uh, high acid, low acid, because you don't want to get them mixed up because that's where the bad bacteria come in. Um, let's see, like your low acids would be your beans, peas, corn, green beans, okra, carrots, stuff like that would be in your pressure canner. Um, your pressure canner, we'll talk about that last because it is a little bit more in depth. But when you're doing your jellies and stuff, you can also water bath them or you can use a steam canner. This was new to me and it's pretty neat. It don't require as much water. You put two quarts of water in the bottom. It's got a rack. It also holds seven quarts, eight pints. You would fill your jars, put them in here, put the top on it. It has a gauge on top that is color coded for your zone. And the zone I'm in is up to 1000 uh, feet altitude. When canning, it's always great to know your altitude. That way you know how long and how much poundage and stuff like that to can with. Um, you can search on your phone, just Google what altitude am I at? And it automatically tells you by your location. Um, we're like almost at a thousand, we're not quite at a thousand. So once it got to a thousand on here in the green marker, I would start my timer for the estimated time that was in the recipe that I was doing. Now, jellies, you run into, you add lots of syrup, well, I mean, lots of sugar and pectin. You have liquid pectin, which is in a blue box. Some recipes call for liquid pectin. You have your Sergio original, which you use when you're making with sugar, like a lot of things call for like four to six cups, even more of sugar. And then your no sugar or less sugar, uh, sure gel is pink. That's for if you want to not, uh, you want to go buy a recipe where you're using half the amount of sugar or some that has no. The way I remember it is pink is like sweet and low and original is uh, yellow. That way I know. Um, you want you want to do, you bring your sauces in a saucepan. Always use stainless steel saucepans when you're uh, baking your jellies, uh, your sauces, your relish, anything that you're going to cook before filling in a jar, use stainless steel or enamel coated because aluminum and any of these uh, other metals can have a chemical reaction um, once jarred later on. So
So your utensils be stainless steel or wooden, uh, preferably just stainless steel, all stainless steel. You don't have nothing to worry about. Um, let's see. Once you get all that, you want to you want to make sure your jars, you have jelly jars. Well, it's kind of hard to see the size, but you have your jelly jar, you have your pint jars, quart jars, and those are all the different sizes. And they also make the little jelly jars that are about half the size of this jelly jar. Um, you want to make sure that they're sterile. And by sterile, I usually place them in my water bath tanner. And I wash them in soapy water, get them ready, put them in there, and let them heat up. And that's why in rolling boiling water, that way I know they're sterile. I take them out with a jar lifter. This is a jar lifter thing. It just kind of picks up your jars out of the hot water, dump it, and put my hot liquid in it. Now, so you don't splatter it everywhere. This little funnel fits right over the jar. It fits regular mouth, wide mouth. It's great. You ladle it down in there, and you don't make a mess. Once you get through uh, doing that, I uh, suggest you take uh, the air bubbler. You don't want no air bubbles, so it's called a debubbler. Try to see. It's a little thing. You want head space. You make sure with jellies, there's a quarter head space. There's a little mark on this. You stick it on the rim, and it shows you you're at a quarter head space. That's how far you want to fill it up with your jelly. Most jellies, you don't have to. Um, it's more when you're pressure canning and you've got produce, you take your debubbler and push it around to make all the air bubbles come out. Because, like I said, bacteria grows in your air bubbles, any kind of air. So you want all the air out. Um, so there's that. You would take white vinegar on a clean towel. I like to keep my vinegar in this little bottle. You just kind of push down on it, and it gives vinegar on your rag. I think I bought this off Amazon or the dollar store. It's, I think it was used for like nail polish remover or something. That's what it was intended for, but it works great with your vinegar. Take this, wipe your rim, and while you're wiping, make sure to inspect for any cracks, chips, or anything that would prevent a sealing. Then wipe the ring. I like to wipe the ring. Can't never wipe it enough. Your lids are in a warm uh, little pot of stove, not boiling water, just warm. You want to keep your lids. That way the little rubber seal around it is kind of warm. That way when it attaches to your jar, it seals better. If you don't want to burn your finger, they have these little magnetic sticks that reaches down in there and grabs it. Then you can put it on there like that. And when you're putting your rings on, put them on. And you just want them finger tight. Just not even tie it, just until it stops spinning. Place them in there. Make sure the water's over the top of them and process them for however long time the recipe calls for. Now, say you're processing pint jars, jelly jars, and quarts all together, you will process your time for the size of the quart jar. Whatever your largest jar is, that's the, quart, that's the poundage and the time that you will process for. So, let's see if I have, make sure I can told you all your stuff that you need. Uh, your bowl remove, your clean towels your white vinegar, your timer, know your altitude. Um, I think that's about it uh, as far as the supplies that you'll need. Um, once you uh, take everything out, don't set your hot jars on a surface, uh, like right on your countertop. Put a towel down underneath them because they're going to have to sit there for um, 12 to 24 hours. So put a towel there. That way you're setting them down on that towel. That way it's not heating up that countertop. And don't disturb them for that period. You'll hear them ping and everything. But once that they've cooled and you go back and you want to check your seals, that you take your rings off. There's not a ring on this one. It's, but you take it and you hold it by that. I mean, that's how you know if they're sealed. Then you can feel and it'll pop up and down if it's not. Then wash them in hot soapy water to clean off if they siphoned any. Um, this one's Sloppy Joe that I put up. Um, I pressure canned it. So um, I made sure, but it has, you can see a ring. That's the fat. This is hamburger meat and everything in here. But it's sealed. Like I said, this was in April. So, I mean, you're going to, and then you can put them up. If something don't seal, if you notice when you're checking it and it pops off or something, don't throw it away. Put it directly in the refrigerator, then use it. It hasn't sat out long enough to go bad. So go ahead. And put that in there. 
don't know if you can hear that, but that's what it'll sound like if it don't seal. Um, so pretty much water bathing. Once you do that, label it. That way you're not playing the guessing game in your pantry later on. Store them um, like 50 to 70 degrees, dark, cool place. Um, we keep them in our pantry or on our shelves, uh, just somewhere where they're not getting fluctuating heat and cold and different temperature changes that would cause any kind of mold or bacteria to grow. Um, let's, we can move on to pressure canning. So I, I was going to tell you first, I was going to show you some of the different Mrs. Wages. If you want to make salsa, she has a pack, um, dill pickles, stuff like that. That way you know what all that is. That way I can set it to the side because of our pressure canner. They make, there's several different kinds of pressure canners. Um, there's Presto, which is an older brand and a lot of people have, um, Nesco maybe is, I think the other one. I can't remember. Okay. I, I had press, uh, one and, but I got an all American. I have, a, I have a large family, six kids, grandbaby. So I can a lot. This thing's heavy. Um, it's all stainless. It is a gauged and weighted pressure cooker. It has racks inside. I have one rack down. I can put seven quarts in there, set this on top, and fill the top with eight pints. Or I can do eight pints on the bottom, eight pints on top. And it locks into place with a little latch. That way it's secured on there. Um, I mean, it's not secure because like secure care lock, you lock it in there and you have these little locks on each side that come up and screw on so you have that extra security to help it hold it on while it's under pressure but with pressure canning um it's a little bit you want to especially follow the recipes because there's some things that you can pressure can some things you can't you need to know your weight especially if you're doing meat um like this was beef stew well, yeah, I don't know if you can see up there. This is raw packed beef stew. It has carrots, potatoes, and stew meat in it. Um, and it's canned in beef broth. I raw packed it. And raw packing means you're taking cold meat and you're putting it in a cold jar, which they're clean cold jars. I wash them, set them to the side. You pack them down in there as much as you can fit in the jar. And then you take your little debubbler and push it down, trying to get all the air out. You're going to fill it up to one inch headspace with the liquid of your choice. So um, you got that. Clean your jar lid, put your lids on, and you stick them in there. Now, if you're pressure canning cold pack, raw pack, or vegetables in cold water, always start your pressure canner with cold water, cold in cold, and bring up to temperature together. Now, if you're making uh, pasta sauce or like this sloppy joe, it's hamburger meat and all the different tomato sauces and stuff. It was hot when I ladled it into my uh, jar. So therefore I have hot boiling water in my pressure canner. Now my pressure canner has about two quarts of water in the bottom. That's all I need to pressure can with. Always read the instructions that comes with your pressure canner. Uh, make sure everything's sealed. Stick it in there. I put a splash of vinegar in there. It just kind of helps keep your jars from clouding up. You're going to deep bubble all the time. Make sure that wipe clean place in your canner. Now, once it's in your canner, you're going to lock all the little things. There's six of them on this one. Turn your heat up so that your vent here, it's a little spout sticking out, um, starts spitting and sputtering and steam comes out of it. You want to let it vent for 10 minutes once you see a steady stream of steam coming out. So let it go 10 minutes. Always keep this little vent clean when you get through canning. Clean it out so no obstructions. That way it can let off that pressure. Then you're going to place your little jiggler. Juggle, jiggle, jiggler. Um, it has 5, 10, and 15 weights on it. That is where your ice tube comes into effect again. You, like I said, we're almost 1,000, so I do 10. Uh, and a lot of them just go up to 15. I don't even know really what ice tube you have to be at 5. But once this is at uh, steaming for 10 minutes, take this. Be careful when you put it over because it steam's hot. Then you drop it. Now, this is when you start seeing your gauge here go up. It'll start going up. If you put it on 10, when it gets to 10, it'll start rattling. 
And once it has a steady rattle, I like three rattles in a minute, sometimes four, I start timing. Now, um, corn was 85 minutes. So I set a timer for 85 minutes. Um, what I rotel the other day, I um, done rotel and that was 25 minutes. So um, I timed it 25 minutes. 25 minutes, the timer goes off, let it cool. Watch my gauge go back down. Then I take off my little jiggler and it still has steam coming out. I let it kind of wait for like five, 10 minutes. That way I'd know. Then I slowly undo these, which also I want to show when I do that. If this is for when you're water bath canning or steam canning, any of it, when you are done and you're ready to take your jars out, open your lid away from you. That way the steam goes that way and not in your face because that steam coming out is super hot and will scald you. So always lift up when you're doing that. And then you will take your jar lifter, reach in, grab jars and place them on the counter. And that's the same as water bathing. You'll leave them for 12, 24 hours, let them cool, check for seals, label and put them up. So that is that. Put this up, like I said, it's big and heavy. And I want to show you the books. Oh, I was going to show y'all, like the other day when I told you blanch your tomatoes and you peel them, don't throw away your tomato peels. You take them, put them in your dehydrator, let them dehydrate, put them in a blender. I have like a little Nutribullet blender and make tomato powder for soups or anything you want to sneak vegetables in. You can do that. You can add uh, different spices to that and it can be a spicy tomato powder, you know, sprinkle on bread, focchia breads, anything like that. So I have that. We don't waste nothing. You drip the onions, anything you think of, we use. This is the book, the blue book, Guide to Preserving. It has all your recipes, instructions. It also has in the back, it's like, what if something went wrong? Why is my jar siphoning? Why didn't it steal? Why are there bubbles? Or anything, questions you have, they're in here a lot of times. The one I had a while ago, the all new fall book of canning and preserving. It has tons of great recipes in it. Uh, like a, it tells you how to do refrigerator pickles. That's using kind of like the fermenting uh, salsa, tacos, marmalades, jellies. It's all in that one. This is the Ball's Complete Home Preserving Book. Um, it has all kinds of different ketchups and barbecue sauces, jellies. I mean, it's endless, the stuff that you can do. Like I said, Altitudes in there talks about your low acid food, your hot acid foods, your headspace. It's all in there, which all the canning books usually have that. This is the ultimate ball canning book. It's a little bit smaller handheld one. It's great to have. This is a new one. It's called the Complete Guide to Pressure Canning by Dan Devro. Um, this one is where the meals in the jar, kind of like my beef stew, my sloppy joe. Uh, stuff like that is here. Chicken curry, meat and bean chili. I mean, barbecue pulled pork. This is great. Um, this is when you get out of your uh, comfort zone and start doing meals in a jar. Um, this is a great book to start on that. So it took me a little bit because I was new. Well, I wasn't new. I've been around canning my whole life. But, you know, you when I'm feeding my kids and my husband and my family, I want to make sure I do it right. So this is where... Um, it made me a little nervous, but after canning all my vegetables and stuff, I'm, I'm comfortable with it now. There's several things that I do. This one of those do as I say, not as I do kind of things. But yeah, all of that is basically how to preserve your food. Um, if you have any questions, I'm, I'm always here. Um, I have a Facebook page called uh, The Honey Hole Mountain. You can message me on there. I think it's www.facebook.com slash it's either Honey Hole 09 or The Honey Hole 09. You can message me on there. I'll be happy to help you. I'll walk you through um, any problems. I have a YouTube channel um, called The Honey Hole Homestead. I do post some canning, veg canning videos on there and just other things around our homestead. Um, the Garland County EHC office, 
I know that they do canning uh, classes sometimes. I'm not quite sure on how that, if they do it and when they do it, you'd have to actually look and go to the, the extension office maybe can tell you. Um, the books, like I showed you. And also, if you like watching videos and want to watch more canning and get more ideas, there is Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, a lot of places that do canning. Um, for instance, I follow the homesteading family. She does a lot of canning and preserving. There's the Prairie Homestead, Acre Homestead, and a Good Life Farm. Um, they're all like Facebook and YouTube. So they help give you some better ideas on things and they walk you through things. Um, also, if you run across a recipe, the cornstarch, as I have, you cannot can cornstarch, but you can use clear gel powder. This is from Hoosier Hill Farm. So just a tip to throw out there. Um, so be mindful, make sure that your recipes you use are tested and true recipes, not just made up ones. And also last, these are wet jars. A lot of people can in them, they're different. They have snaps and a rubber seal. The timings are different. The measurements are different. Uh, I do not know how to use them. And I personally don't even want to try because it's complicated. And I don't want to complicate anything. This make a good sourdough starter jar. You can start your sourdough and put it in your refrigerator and check on it, stir it. So that's what this gets used for. So has anything that y'all have questions about? Feel free to ask me and thanks for having me again and look forward to seeing y'all again. Thanks, Judy. Jamie, I cannot believe the amount of information you gave in that hour. <laughs> that 45 minutes or whatever you had, that was incredible. I Don't try really miss something. Impressed. I have not tried the meal thing. I, I've done pickles, sauce, I've done the, the acid things, but that and some pressure canning but boy i'll tell you that is wonderful um how much do you think you can say say you put up some pickles you put a big a big jar of pickles and it takes you say how long maybe um, a pints eight pints no well, eight pint, pints um wouldn't take that terribly long did you like you said whatever recipe i went by that I've done the canning part. Two hours would probably do that really fine and easy. Um, now I just put up three, probably two to 300 uh, cobs of corn and to get it brought to a bowl, blanch it, do everything. I was looking at a five hour process and I've yeah. done uh, 36 quarts. I'll tell you, I, the one thing I can say about canning is it is a labor of love. It is. But what you get out of it is so rewarding and you know where it came from. Yes, that's 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 there's no, no chemicals involved and nothing, everything. Mm -hmm. You can use your own spices. You can use everything homegrown just about to do everything. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, I, I applaud you and I, I learned so much. I'm going to watch it again and I may branch out. I bought a new pressure canner last year. So uh, very excited about that. I know it's the weird things in life that excite you. Well, so many but, people hear the horror stories about them blowing up and everything. And I see pictures of them stuck in the ceilings. <laughs> so, well, just, I'll tell you, a friend of ours, and you know her, you'll see her tomorrow at our meeting, uh, used to sit across the room with binoculars <laughs> and gauge. So uh, ask Joan about that. Yes. <laughs> I thank you so much. It was great. Every time... Uh, I can't wait for the next episode. You let me know what it's going to be and we'll have you on and, and just a wonderful job. Well, I look forward to it and I'll be thinking about something else that we can talk about that we do on the homestead. That's awesome. Hey, Paul, do we have any questions? Hey, we have a couple. Um, first of all, I want to say this made me very hungry. So we <laughs> get these questions fast, but um, uh, I want to give people an uh, opportunity to ask a few more questions. Um, we did get a couple, but I'd like some more people in the pot. Or if you just want to share a little story or anecdote about your experiences trying to can, uh, we'd love to hear those too. Um, but before I ask those, um, Jamie, what are some common mistakes you see people make when, when they're just getting into this? Um, not uh, cooking them long enough, like bringing it up to pressure and cooking it for the amount of time with the appropriate weight on it with can when you're pressure canning or even with water bath canning, they don't fill the water up over the tops 
and it scorches the food on the inside and you're also not cooking your vegetables and stuff pressurizing them so therefore the those organisms and stuff the bad bacteria is in there so that's usually the lot you know the, the non-sealing jars why are my jars not sealing so that's usually the one that everybody says well we had um uh, two questions that are pretty much the same topic um on youtube my first baby asked can you store your canned foods without the lids or rings and Anna on Facebook says, thank you so much. I see your process jars you are showing do not all have rings. Can you store process jars without rings long term? Yes, um, storing, that's what is recommended by the ball is to store without your ring on there. That way, um, like this is my Rotel. Why, um, I do have it and sometimes I do just kind of stick them on there just enough so they're on there, but just so I don't, you run out, you have rings coming out your ears by the time it's over with. But um, you're not supposed to. That way, if it comes unsealed while it's in your pantry, you'll smell it. It won't take long. And you'll smell the rotten, putrid smell. If you had your ring on tight, then you, it would keep that. It would break the seal, but it would still hold it in there. And you would run the risk of you'd have bad food. You open it up and you'd be like, oh, gosh. So, yeah, you can store them. It's recommended with no rings on them. And you can stack them. Just put um, the cardboard, like the boxes that the jars come in. I keep all my boxes. That way you set the other box on top of it. That way there's a layer between the jars to protect them. Well, uh, I'm going to do one more call for questions. And um, before one of those two, my first baby 1000 or Anna wins by default we'll, we'll flip a coin if it's just you two um, we had a wonderful comment uh, from Debbie who says great info proud the next generation is in good hands that's yeah. the truth and the word is being spread so Jamie excellent job and man it's almost like uh, chemistry yes but when you get it down it is so rewarding and I, we just opened our last can of salsa and I'm like Dang, my tomatoes didn't do good. The only thing that's come on this year is cucumbers. I'm taking Jamie about 10 pounds of cucumbers tomorrow so she can make pickles. But, you know, maybe a late crop will get some good tomatoes and, and beans and things like that. So, And they can can stuff from the grocery store. If somebody's just starting out and they don't have a big garden, yeah, go to the farmer's market. Um, substitute that way get your organic produce at the grocery store i mean usually your recipes will tell you how much you need that way you're not wasting money just go get it and you can try it that way it doesn't hurt to try it it doesn't hurt to try it and if you're afraid of it okay, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> you'll know your your lids won't seal you'll see something different it's it's it, it is it's a fun experience and it's it's work, but it's rewarding. And boy, I've learned a whole lot more from you and I'm going to start doing some more. All right, let's have our winner, Paul. Okay, let's see here. Jamie, pick a hand, left, left or right? Uh, left. Okay, left. We have... Anna. <laughs> All right. That was a great number generator, Paul. That was fun. So, Anna, I'm going to write your name on this. We'll have a hot spring sod and turf $25 gift certificate for you to pick up here at the library. You can come by in the morning or anytime, and it will be yours. I appreciate everybody for watching. I appreciate Jamie for all of our hard work and our knowledge. That was just incredible. And as always, I appreciate the Garland County Library. They are just awesome. Awesome team, awesome plan. The future is going to be very bright with them. So anyway, we'll see you next month. Oh, next month, we've got a really cool I'm thing. I'm very excited about that one. Uh, yes, I forgot to tell this. I've, I've been oh, doing a presentation. But, We're doing but, something on bats. Yes. Oh. Yes. And we have a really uh, exciting presenter. He's very passionate about bats. 
That ties into our uh, fair theme for uh, Garland County Master Gardener. It's all about bats. So we're going to have a competition that includes bats and butterflies and, and all kind of bee pollinators. And so we will be talking about that. And I hope that next month our extension agent, Luke Duff, will join us and tell us what's going on with 4-H and things like that. So we're, we're expanding Know It to Grow It. And I appreciate y'all being with us, but bats next month, it's going to be great. We need to save them. I can't wait for that one. Uh, and, and if you enjoyed this episode, remember this was just episode three uh, on the homesteading topic featuring Jamie. And you can go back and watch those first two if you missed them. And if you want to share this one or you tuned in late, uh, you can go back and watch the beginning on Facebook or YouTube, wherever you're watching. Uh, watch those other two episodes on homesteading and all the other previous Master Gardeners episodes uh, we've done. Like we said at the beginning, this is number 17, Know What to Grow It program. All right. Have a good night, y'all. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.